<laughs> Dr. G. Ah, it's Scott. Actually, but okay, so I gotta admit, I don't know how podcasts work. I've never done one before. I know how Zoom meeting works. Um, and I, I don't know nothing about birth and no babies when it comes to relationships. So listen, uh, what did I tell you? I'm gonna make it easy. <laughs> That's right, my motto. You. you too. Nice yeah. background, by the way. But where's the library? Where's the dog? Um, the the I'm actually at home right now, so I'm using the uh, the virtual backgrounds. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's either uh, my go tos are either you know the uh, Bilbo Baggins house or the uh, the Space Knight on a shark with a dinosaur and a rocket propelled gr grenade. Okay, so I have to tell you, um, first of all, obviously we like people who like us. And the first thing I liked about you was when you started mentioning me on your channel, in your comments. Um, you know, hey, you should check out Canada's dating coach. She she seems to really understand things. And I yeah. was like, oh, hey, you know, we're I'm like, look at this psychiatrist, <laughs> right? And and you know, myself having dropped out of university because I learned so much faster on my own. Um, it it was nice to get that recognition from somebody who has the letters after their name. But I got to tell you you had me at so i'm a nerd <laughs> you remember that TikTok, and you're talking about the algorithms and what you were finding was coming up on your on your feed yeah i uh i i just have learned to embrace my nerdiness over time so um you know hence the hobbit hole background right. the lord of the rings background uh, and, that or everybody would have to be staring at my unmade bed, so. And I liked it when you said that because like attracts like. And that's what I say about myself. I'm a nerd. People say, how do you know this stuff? And I say, I'm a nerd. I am just so passionate about this. I research all of this out of curiosity. And, and then people will say, well, how did you become a dating coach? I'm like, I had to because that combination of me wanting to know so much, plus all these people always like for over 20 years, people come at me with their relationship problems. And then within 10 minutes, they're like, I feel so much better. Um, so let's talk about our specialties. Let's, let's, I, I really, I love the fact that you are a professor. Can we, we can say that? Is that okay to say? Yes. Yeah. I, a um, couple of things before we dive in though, um, let me reciprocate and um, it was, uh, you know, you came across my for your page, for, for your page um, and your even handedness really impressed me. Um, you know, when often people look for dating advice or even complain, uh, the, the human tendency is to run with that complaint, to validate. And you're really good about going, you know what? other people have needs and maybe you've got a blind spot um and not just running with people's first you know limbic responses to that and i really admired that um thank you you teach um what year do you teach like where what is what like something brought you to teaching over anything is am i right or am i wrong you know, um, that's, that's a long kind of journey, but yes, um, my first degree, um, psychology wasn't my first degree. My first degree was actually in um, physical cosmology and physics. Um, and, you know, so all science and math kind of stuff. Uh, but this is, you know, I'm, I'm old AF, uh, as the youths would say, and this was back uh, before dark matter and a lot of the more kind of exotic stuff. And I don't know if you follow physics at all, but there's a lot of exotic stuff going on that's really exciting. And it was before I knew about Stephen Hawking and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, to truncate the story, I, in my, you know, 20 year old arrogance, looked at uh, astronomy, which was, you know, where I was headed. 
and thinking, you know what, I'm just going to spend the rest of my life looking through a telescope and cataloging stars. And that's boring. I want to do, you know, more interesting science. Um, had I been less stupid and um, more thoughtful, I would have probably saw that that was idiotic. But um, psychology appealed to me as sort of the wild west of science because it's such a young science that a lot of it, you know, we're, it's hard to determine causal factors. Everything is multivariate. Um, you know, it's messy and complex and raw. And, you know, just the fact that we can quantify things like emotion or empathy and put numbers on that and manipulate it and study it seemed to me really like an interesting scientific problem. So I went in with the idea of just being a, a scientist, you know, pure scientist. And it was only, I think, um, in my later on in my education that I took on a part-time job as a uh, interventionist in a suicide, um, uh, a place that prevented suicides and just fell in love with the clinical work. And that's what led me to become a clinical psychologist. Ooh, so it was the marriage of the science and the intervention. Um, I like how you're willing to... That was a long rambly answer. That, that's okay. That's that okay. I mean, we learn. Um, you're willing to debate psychology because like you're, you're not a by the book kind of person. Um, I remember there was a TikTok you made where, uh, you know, the book describes toxic masculinity and you're like, um, actually, if you have these traits, this is good. Yep. Yes. Um, that's an area that interests me, but I have to tread carefully because there's this um, really kind of, in my opinion, toxic fusion between um, what should be science and politics. And not only politics, but a particularly kind of destructive politics, which is gender politics and identity politics. Um, you know, knowing that we all have so much more in common than we do different. You know, there are, uh, you know, we're a, a sexually uh, dimorphic species, so that there are in fact gender differences, but really they're minuscule compared to what we have in common. We're all human. We all operate on the same basic principles with small variations, and most of those are acculturated. So with the toxic masculinity, that's a relatively new concept that comes out of um, gender studies programs on uh, particularly uh, North American campuses. Um, and this is a far more American phenomena. You know, it, it's particularly um, uh, the US and Canada. You don't see it as much in Europe. You don't see it as much in other cultures. Um, but these gender studies uh, focus um, areas make clear that they fuse science and politics, science and a social agenda. Now, I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with that. Um, however, if you start with the conclusion and then backfill your methods to demonstrate that conclusion, that's not science. And that's what's going on with a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, to take what it does is it takes typically and I'm not a manly man, you know, I wear glasses and I sit at home and read and I snuggle with my dogs and, you know, I, I don't grow, I can't grow a beard because I'm not manly enough. So this is not <laughs> somebody who's defending their right to be a manly man. This is, um, you know, but the spirit of competition and stoicism are not toxic traits in our environment. They're what cities are built on, what bridges are built on what protection is. And um, it comes at some psychological cost, but it also has many, many psychological benefits. And I think that the idea of having one construct that is universally negative in nature, um, or one construct that you frame as having only negative outcomes, 
but you don't recognize the positive sides of that um, is not a, a, an empirical endeavor. That's a religion. And, um, you know, that's the devil. You've just described the devil. And so, yeah, the, the idea of toxic masculinity at its finest are social constraints on men's behaviors, but that's not how it's used in day-to-day -day language. You know, it's always used as a pejorative. Yeah. Personal question. Sure. Are you married? I am not. Um, I, <sighs> um, I am not fond of getting the government involved in my personal business. Um, and um, I think in our, the way that modern laws are written, um, that men take a terrible, terrible risk when they choose to get married. Um, and a lot of people, uh, you know, both financial and if you're younger and you're interested in having kids, um, you know, all the onus of risk in the way that it's set up right now is really focused on men. You know, women absolutely take some risk going into the deal as well. But uh, the outcomes, you know, if you look at the outcomes, both financially and custody wise, things along those lines um, are the onus of risk tends to skew fairly heavily in one direction. And I think um, a lot of people kind of recoil from that. And we actually see that marriage is at an all time, a 50 year low right now, marriage rates, because so many people see this as such a risky endeavor. Um, so yeah, no, I've just chosen not to, um, but that doesn't mean that, um, I have any kind of hostility towards the idea. It's just uh, not where I'm at in my life right now. Right. We have a prenup. Uh, so yep. we have, Sorry, you know, ahead. because psychologically speaking, um, uh, and maybe it is because of, of the problems that would arise uh, from getting a divorce, um, but people tend to consider splitting up as more of a serious affair when there's a marriage than if they're not married. And so people who are married tend to stay together longer than people who are not married. So the statistics for, for the success of those relationships is higher. Um, so I kind of get the best of both worlds where, you know, I get that sense. I get to say husband and, you know, yeah, like that is my husband kind of thing. And, and, you know, the funny thing was when my husband and I first got together, I was exiting a marriage and, and, you know, I think you should come into a relationship with the negotiation in hand, right? This is what I want. This is what this, you know, this is what's on the table for me. And what I said to him is, I don't want to get married again, but I want the symbolism, which is the rings and calling each other husband and wife and living together. And then we split up one more time because we just split up a few times in the 10 years of fighting that we did. Um, we split up one more time. I got over him and I, I, redefine my next relationship. And so when he wanted to get back with me, I said, I'm sorry, but the man you are is no longer the man I want to be with because I redefine my next relationship. And what I was taking with you is no longer what I want to take with my next partner. And, and what is in my next relationship is marriage for me. And so if you want to be what I've defined, um, that's great. Cause I don't care what body this comes in, <laughs> you know, this, this is just my standard. This is just what I'm looking for. So he came back with marriage and so we got married, but we, we did a prenup. What's his is his, what's mine is mine. Um, and so he still gets to say, we are together because we want to be together, not because we are beholden to each other in any way. We don't have children together. It will not cost him anything if we get a divorce. It won't cost me anything if we get a divorce. Um, so we 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 kind of do get the the best of those two worlds so i absolutely see where you're coming from because of course being a relationship coach on TikTok, i do see the men who are injured by relationships that fall apart and it, it doesn't only cost them their heart it does cost them a lot financially so i i completely understand that i think for a lot of men too and this is not my case but um one of the biggest risks that they take is the difference in custody laws, or, or not custody laws, but the way that custody is often handled by the courts. Um, but this is all honestly kind of outside my wheelhouse. You know, these are more kind of legal 
sorts of things um, that I can't claim any expertise around. But um, I do know that in the US, and I'm not sure if it's the same in Canada, that uh, women are granted primary custody 87% of the time. And um, not only do men lose out financially in the cases of divorce, very often, you know, their, their reason for living is taken away, you know, their children. And one of the things that we do see is that um, men typically have a divorce rate that's, you know, far higher than women just at, you know, at resting levels. But in the cases of divorce, men's suicide rates are a thousand times greater than women's um, post-divorce. Um, not, again, this is not uh, personalizing it, but just, you know, getting into the broader um, scheme of things. And I think that scares a lot of people. And yeah. I think that's uh, one of the, the most uh, one of the reasons for caution that a lot of men go into these relationships with. Right. But yeah. I absolutely agree that if marriage is your goal and the way that you approach it is absolutely, you know, I think clarity and honesty and, you know, um, setting what you expect and what you need in your own life is the only way to be in a healthy relationship, you know, trying to uh, convince or cajole or to uh, manipulate, you know, all those things are doomed. And, you know, the honesty and the forthrightness with which you handled it, I think, is um, probably the foundation for it being effective. <laughs> well, you know what they say, uh, we teach what we most need to learn. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I like that better than you can't do teach. <laughs> um, so with that, that being said, we teach what we most need to learn. Does that, is, is that what you teach at all? Like, does that tie in for you in any way? I'm sorry, can you repeat the if, question for me? If we say we teach what we most need to learn, that is definitely reflected in my work. Is it reflected in yours? <sighs> You know, I got to be honest, I don't have the luxury for that. Um, my job is I'm the director of a, a university training clinic. So um, my job is to take uh, uh, psychologists in training and um, we have an active clinic. And so I supervise their training. And so when I teach, um, it's usually teaching therapy skills, and um, I don't have uh, sort of the, sorry, the circumstances to specialize in a particular area, because in our clinic, we take everybody, and, um, you know, so one minute, I'll be supervising a case of somebody who's uh, transgendered and struggling, and in the next, I'll be supervising a case of somebody who's 90 and having anger, anger issues that are brought on by st steroid prescriptions. And, um, you know, so it really, if I were to specialize, I honestly don't even know what that would be anymore because I've been doing this for so long and I love, I love the teaching part. I love the, co you know, it's really kind of coaching a tennis swing. Say, okay, what did you do there? What did you do there? What could be more effective? How are you seeing this case that's leading you to that kind of interaction? And um, that's that's my first love, I think. Okay. So I, I, here's a question. Uh, very curious about this, uh, especially coming from your perspective. What is the biggest mistake psychologists make? There are several. Okay. <laughs> um, um, and I think they're developmentally mediated. When I'm training new psychologists, and this is true of therapists and not just psychologists, um, a young therapist will be really nervous. A lot of people don't realize that when somebody's very early on in their career and their training, you know, when you first sit down with another human being that's relying on you to help, it's terrifying. Um, I remember 
when I was in training, I was maybe my second year in training, and I was talking to somebody who was particularly um, struggling. And they were talking, and I thought to myself, man, this guy really needs to see somebody. And it took me like two heartbeats to go, oh shit, that's me. And um, so there's a lot of fear there. There's, there's a lot of fear. And in that fear, I think new therapists try to rush in with a solution you know, just go right in and stampede to, okay, here's the problem. And, you know, they've got all this didactic knowledge of, you know, this behavior leads to this behavior. And, you know, they see the causal pathway there and what the person will need to do eventually to fix it. And then they'll go in with this kind of prescriptive approach and start telling people what they need to do, which is going to be accurate, but it's not where the person is at. You know, when you've got somebody who's in distress, you need to let them run. You know, you need to sit down and shut up and be patient and let them essentially tire themselves out. I, the metaphor that I use very often is like fishing. Um, I don't fish, but from what I understand, I don't like hurting fish. Um, you got to let the fish run on the line until it tuckers itself out and then you can start reeling. Um, but if yeah. you fight it while well, it still has a lot of energy, it's just going to be a struggle and the line is going to break. So in therapy, you have to be patient. You have to let the line run. You have to let them vent and get it all out. And once they're emptied out, then you can start not telling them what to do, but leading them on what to do and where to go. So I think the, the number one mistake that I see young therapists make uh, is stampeding to a solution when it's too soon. And that's brought by their own nerves, essentially. I think the mistake I see older, more experienced therapists is just empathy burnout. Um, I think a lot of people have this over-glamorized image of what a psychologist is and does, and um, it's not. It's a gritty job. It's a hard job. It's a dirty job. Um, and, you know, you're working with people who are in pain all the time, every day, hour after hour. And um, that takes a toll on a person. And the, the ability to separate from that when you go home is something that's only learned over years. And I think a lot of people uh, deal with it by shutting down entirely. But uh, near the, you know, in their later years, it's really hard because, you know, if you're seeing somebody who's whining about, say, a relationship that they themselves sabotaged, mm -hmm. um, and the previous uh, client that you had was a child who has burns all over him from his mother putting cigarettes out on his skin, you know, it's going to be hard to be empathic with that next person. And so, you know, keeping those empathy batteries charged and realizing that everybody has their own struggle and is their own, in their own place in life is very hard to do when you're doing it on a full-time basis. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. Um, so I'm not a psychologist. I'm a coach. And so for me, the way that a session looks like is I do tell people what to do. Yep. And so people come to me and, and, and I, I, I do what you talked about, which is you let the line run out because they need, they need to tell you, right? And, right. And, and I'll say to people, you know, make sure you're writing down the questions you want to ask because I want to make sure that I'm addressing everything. And, and so, you know, people definitely need to tell me the story uh, in order for me to address what it is that they want to change. And I'll ask some more questions to decode it some more, get to the bottom of it. And, and like you, you've, you've seen, I don't let people lie to themselves. If they're putting the focus and the blame on someone else, and in my questioning, I can see where the source is, which is themselves. Like in one session, I will let somebody tell me what's going on. I'm also a behaviorist. So I also hear what's happening behind what they're saying. Right. Um, and so I, there's, there's a lot to be decoded in a conversation, a lot to be understood. And, and I, I get it very quickly, which is why I'm good at what I do. And so they tell the story. I gain some more on it just to clarify. 
I get them understanding where the problem is coming from, what the source is, and then I give them the tools to start using in order to turn it around. Always meditation, that's always one of them. And then whatever else they need based on what their particular problem is. Where do you feel somebody might need a psychologist over a coach? That's an excellent question. And I don't know that there's a clear demarcation point for that. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm also, just to write on the question, I'm also very often asked what the difference between counseling and therapy is. And to be honest, I don't have a real good answer for that either, because I think, you know, there's just, it, as a behavioral scientist, I, I see the world in normal curves. And I just see them all on different points of a curve. And, you know, um, one, a famous statistician, uh, Cohen, said, surely God loves 0.06 as much as he loves 0.05. Um, you know, these, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of overlap, you know, where somebody might fall. Um, I would say coaching is um, oftentimes more valuable than therapy uh, because most people, in my opinion, um, are good at, at good are good at heart. You know, they're good natured. They want the best. They don't want to hurt anybody. And um, when they find themselves kind of tripping over and over again, very often it's not anything sinister underneath, but rather a skills deficit. And I think that's where coaching really comes in. Um, and coaching, in my mind, take is placed in this pantheon of uh, professions that I really respect. Um, you've got coaches and occupational therapists and physical therapists um, that really kind of go in and take damage and help it heal. And um, therapists, I think, and psychologists are really good when there's um, something deeper to get into. You know, when there's uh, trauma from childhood or anxiety that's preventing you from moving forward or a depression or, um, you know, any kind of corn, the cornucopia of diagnoses that I'm not a fan of the DSM, but you can read up on. Um, there are very many really effective technologies for helping ameliorate those and getting somebody into the place where I think then coaching would be maximally beneficial for them. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, what do you think of attachment styles? Is that in the DSM? It is not. Um, okay. And that's an excellent question. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to support the idea of attachment styles and how they affect our later relationships. Um, and here, I'm assuming you're talking about like anxious avoidant, um, that kind of stuff. And yeah, that is, uh, we can demonstrate attachment styles in very early childhood, um, almost pre-language childhood, or actually pre-language childhood. Um, as a matter of fact, Writing on that, um, did you know that we can test whether or not somebody will grow up to be an introvert or an extrovert with nearly 98% accuracy at six months old? We can tell what they're going to be as, as an adult with what we call a complex visual stimulus field. Um, so what I don't know is whether or not these attachment styles are something that's congenital to the person or if they're developed through parenting. And I don't know that we have a really good handle on that because we can't do controlled studies. But what we do know through longitudinal studies is these attachment styles really do impact the way that we conduct our relationships as adults. And I think any good therapist um, will immediately recognize what those forces and, and presses are. Um, as a matter of fact, in, you know, my, again, I'm not a, a couples therapist or a relationship therapist, but when I do deal with relationship stuff, I actually go back to attachment styles and my colloquial think, you know, thinking of it very often in adult relationships is, uh, 
um, approach approach, avoid avoid, or approach avoid, where you know approach approach is when two people just keep clashing together. You know they're they're always rushing in, and those actually tend to be high conflict but stable relationships. You know long lasting but not necessarily the happiest. Then you've got avoid avoid, where th you know you're just freezing each other out. And the most interesting and difficult is the anxious attachment, um, you know, when somebody's got an anxious attachment and you see this, what I call approach avoid, uh, where somebody will step in to close the interpersonal gap and the other person will kind of back up like their personal space has been invaded. And then the, per you know, so that'll create this uncomfortable space for person A who will then try to close that gap and the other person will back off and you find, uh, you know, some couples just in this continual uh, cycle of resentment and fear. And those, those are really difficult to deal with for me because I, you know, it's not my thing. Right. I personally avoid it because I'm, because I, I mean, I like to keep things simple. Um, I, I feel like people wear attachment styles like an STD. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. and it's like, when should I disclose this, right? As though they are diseased in some way because they've been labeled with an attachment style. And for me, myself, I like to scale it back. Before you had a label, you were thinking about behaviors. Let's go back to thinking about behaviors and let's address the behavior you wanna change. And then let's give you the behavior that will give you the different outcome. Um, and so it kind of takes off this sort of inner stigma that I'm wrong. I'm built wrong. I'm created right. wrong. Um, so I that's agree a hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I feel that way about most labels in psychology, not just attachment styles, but as soon as you label something, um, people tend to believe that it becomes fixed and there's so little, I mean, our human brains, you know, we have more neurons in our head than there are stars in our galaxy. And it is specifically evolved to be adaptable. And um, I think that if you lose the, the labels and look at the behavior, then you can build tools. Um, so I agree 100%. And I think labels are often uh, hurdles rather than clarifiers. I like you more. <laughs> Yay. I feel like this is all one way. I feel like I should be asking you questions. It's, it's weird for me to be on the question answering side of things like this. Do you actually have questions for me? Tell me about the no kissing for three months thing. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I've always found that to be, to be one of your more interesting. You go back to it and I absolutely understand the reason why, but I'd like to hear you talk about it because, you know, TikTok is such you know, you can, you've only got 60 seconds. So you, it, everything has to be short and punchy and you don't have the luxury of really kind of explaining the, the whys behind a thing. So tell me the whys. Okay. Um, so biologically speaking, uh, kissing creates phenylethylamine and I know I mispronounce it, but I like the way I say it. Um, and, and so, you know, like the way that I explain is everybody's lips secretes a chemical that doesn't do anything to, to them until it comes in contact with another set of lips. That combination is an aphrodisiac. But here's what I put together. Um, women will kiss on the first, second, or third date because they're going at the man's pace. And the man's pace is fertility cycle, which is 24-7. They know subconsciously to seal the deal with a kiss because they know what happens when a woman kisses. This is what happens. She says no to anybody else who wants an opportunity. And so looking at that behavior, there's obviously a chemical component to the kiss that when a woman is in mate-seeking mode versus just having fun, because I've been there. I've, I've, I've kissed plenty of boys just having fun and not become attached. But if I'm in mate seeking mode and I kiss somebody and then the next day somebody says, can I take you out? I say, no, I'm seeing someone. And most women do that. Most women commit with a kiss. Interesting. But if you're looking for a long-term relationship, a vetting process needs to take place like the mammal that we are. When we are mate selecting, when a mammal is mate selecting, they observe the males putting on a display and select the best one. That's what we females need to do as well, but we are not because we are going at the man's pace. So no I kissing for three really months. Well explained. 
Go ahead. Say that again. So no kissing for three months puts the, the, the pace back in the female's hands where it should be when a female is, a, is selecting a mate. Um, and, and, and so by setting a date, you take your mind off the question of when. When you take your mind, because I, we could just say, I want to wait till I know you better. Well, when do you know me better? right? And so every single date, you're wondering, do I know him well enough yet? And then sometimes like from one date to the next, you have fluctuations, like I'm feeling it right now. But then the next one, you're like, oh, you know, like I'm calm again. And so that there may be a, a chemical or hormonal component to that too, right? Like your pheromones might have smelled particularly good that day. So who knows? But when you set a date that's three months out, first of all, we all know the honeymoon period, which is the chemical high that happens when there is newness anyway. Um, that chemical high gets hijacked with phenylethylamine, which is why women miss all the red flags. So just remove the chemical and you will not miss the red flags. By the way, it's no kissing, no sleepovers for three months, because at the end of the day, when you are apart from each other, you're going to think about how wonderful she is, which means she's going to get carved into your neural pathways. She's going to think about how the day went and pick up on those red flags again that were, you know, overtaken by the next moment. So it creates a vetting opportunity. It, it gives time and space to think. Um, and listen, if the chemistry was there in, you know, in the beginning, even if it wasn't there at the beginning, I'm like, don't go for the spark, go for the slow burn. I was not attracted to my husband when I first met him. But over time, as I got to know him, all the pieces of the puzzle came together until I watched the man walk. And I went, ooh, baby, that's confident. And that was the last one. And boom, like whoosh, it just happened. Um, everything, everything happened for me when, when that last piece of the puzzle fell into place. And then that was it, game over. I was enthralled. So setting a date that is beyond the honeymoon period or just at towards the tail end of that honeymoon period means you make an educated decision about who you choose for a long-term relationship. Do you mediate that based on age? I know, you know, for as somebody in his fifties, you know, for me, three months is not a long period of time. Um, for a 19 year old, I think, three months is substantially longer. Um, and, you know, their brains aren't finished cooking until 26. So there's a greater, you know, there's more hormones and impulsivity there. Is it more important to follow this rule at one age versus another? Or how do you see age being a factor here? Or Age is all? not a factor. Because, okay. um, you know, listen, you can be 21 and want a relationship. Or you can be 21 and just want to have fun. So if you, you make your behavior match your intent, if you just want fun, have fun. If you want a relationship, you vet. Yeah, I like that. How do people take to it when you're coaching them? It depends on their ego. Really? Tell me about that. Well, somebody who desires instant gratification, somebody who gets their validation from someone else's attention are less likely to, we know the marsh, one marshmallow today versus two marshmallows tomorrow, right? Um, and so this is where you see the people who are unwilling to give up their one marshmallow today. They want to eat their marshmallow. They want their marshmallow to get eaten right away, you know? And so they're not going to wait three months for a first kiss, um, maybe because of insecurity. Uh, the programming is if, and the thing is the programming has been nailed in by selfish short-term thinkers who say, I can't wait. If you don't give it to me now, you miss your opportunity. What women fail to realize is those are the ones you need to let walk away. Those are the opportunities to let pass. Absolutely. And there 100%. are always opportunities to let pass. Um, and one of the things that you I think I remember you talking about before that I really like is getting out of the scarcity mindset, you know, that every opportunity has to be acted on. And, um, you know, that's not true. That's it not it true. doesn't. There, yeah. are, there are and will be lots of opportunities. So let me ask you this. What do you think about meditation? I'm a big fan. Um, there are... Um, 
in psychological science, um, probably the most empirical arena of psychology is behaviorism. Um, you know, everything is quantified, everything is measured, everything is, you know, um, antecedent behavior, consequence, the ABCs of behavior. And we do uh, very specific, like, uh, b applied behavior analysis. Um, and so, over time, there have been three major iterations of that. Um, you know, the first was uh, born by um, Ivan Pavlov and John Watson in the 1900s. And then there was another major uh, kind of revolution that came in the 40s and 50s and 60s with B.F. Skinner that led to radical behaviorism. We are currently in what people refer to as the third wave of behaviorism. And that's uh, led by people that most people have never heard of before, like uh, Stephen Hayes and David Barlow. Um, you know, very famous. If you're, a, if you're a psychologist, these names are famous. And um, they have pioneered a kind of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, um, or ACT. And I'm not necessarily an ACT practitioner, but um, a lot of the fundamentals is that therapy very often is focused on change. And the most effective way to change is to accept the way things are and to be able to visualize the way that you want them to be. And you cannot do that without mindfulness. And so mindfulness becomes a core training factor in modern behavioral interventions um, so that somebody can uh, sit with this kind of limbic arousal but still maintain a clarity of thought and actually walk themselves to where it is they need to be. And meditation is probably the most effective way to develop mindfulness because you can't accidentally develop this. As a matter of fact, um, our entire lives right now are specifically set up to distract us from being mindful. You know, TikTok itself um, is just crushing people's attention spans, you know, because they're like, swipe, swipe, you know, oh my God, this guy's been talking for 15 seconds, swipe. Um, and to have a space where you cultivate attention, mindfulness, and that doesn't mean relaxation, that just means sustained attention, um, is critical to being able to develop towards uh, a, a greater behavioral flexibility. Mm -hmm. I love that I have people who uh, profess that they have ADHD uh, who have started meditating because of what I teach and find that they feel better, yes. which is makes me very happy. Change, change always makes me happy. What kind of meditation do you encourage people to do? Uh, binaural beats. So frequency. Uh, yep. frequency meditation and then uh, channeling your thoughts. So I, do, I don't, I, I, I say I'm not insane. I'm not unreasonable. I'm not going to ask you to think nothing for 10 minutes straight. So I give them four modes to cycle through for their time while they're sitting with the music. So yes, quiet mind, but then also gratitude. And then um, I am, which is uh, acknowledgement and manifestation. And I surrender. That sounds like it has its roots in um, a lot of Buddhist kind of approaches where, uh, um, except for the technological aspects, you know, I don't, I don't know that uh, Buddha was into um, uh, theta entrainment or, you know, things like that, but, um, excuse me, that ability to uh, manifest is um, a central, you know, is, been a technology that the West has let languish for thousands of years. And I, I think that we're actually starting to really see the wisdom behind that. And that makes me happy. I love that. Do you meditate? Every day. You do. What's yep. your practice? Mostly Zen stuff. I've been doing it for um, probably 30 years and I'm terrible at it. Um, so I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is, you know, if I meditate more, I will become better at it. And I don't know that I've become any better at it in 30 years.
years. So my style of meditation is just awareness and then, you know, noticing when my mind has wandered and bringing it back and bringing it back and bringing it back. And so meditation is really just an exercise. It's, again, I think a lot of people misunderstand meditation to mean relaxation and it's not, it's a very active process. You know, you are focusing the mind on a singular point and then, you know, just focusing on that point and your mind is going to wander. And it's not a matter of, um, you know, punishing yourself, but just gently bringing yourself back to that one point over and over and over again. Um, so that's, that's pretty much how I do it. Um, how many, what's your daily average minutes? You know, one of the things I should be better about is carving out a specific time of day, but I, I don't. So I would say overall every day, maybe about 30 minutes. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily all at one time. Um, right. Sometimes oh, yeah. it is. Sometimes I'll do it a couple of times a day for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you know, sometimes I'll sneak it in between appointments um, just to, you know, kind of, again, focus in. Um, usually it's in the evening when I'm done with everything and I'm able to just uh, sit and relax and um, practice. And it's a practice. I think of it as practicing. Absolutely. I love this. I really, I, I, I appreciate you doing this with me because, you know, like I said, I'm a nerd. And, uh, and it's so fun to meet a fellow nerd. Again, I very much appreciate the validation that I get from you looking at me and going, yeah, she knows what she's talking about. And especially yeah. since you're a professor and you're a trainer and you train people to do this. And, um, I, you know, I try to not let my ego speak for me, but it does get flattered. So <laughs> it, it, I, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of ego, you know, um, I, if there's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, it's good for you every once in a while. Um, if, yeah. Um, how do, let me ask you this, because we were, um, um, I know this is part of the active podcast, um, and we were kind of emailing back and forth, and I said, for myself, when I was in training, um, I did like a sick, I hate relationship work. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Um, because it takes so, I'm not sure. Can I swear or should I? Oh, I just, I, are you kidding? Like fix that shit and assholes is on my book covers. Oh man. It takes so much goddamn patience that I just don't have. Um, and I was telling you that I did in my training a six month rotation, uh, working psychologically with children who were dying from cancer. And I enjoyed that more than I enjoy relationship therapy and relationship work because it's just so frustrating how do you deal with that as a coach in your own personal you know when you work with people how do you how do you deal with that level of frustration because there's so much um yeah it's just so frustrating uh i don't put myself in it i'm on the outside looking in so there's that i, I don't take on and you know i I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why I don't take it on, but I don't. Okay. And, and what makes me good at it is the fact that I've been through it. So, and I, I mean, through it, I mean, like, you know, from, from the childhood issues that led me to make those decisions to get in those relationships that ended up having those problems like cheating um, and, and lack of trust and all of them abuse. Um, and, and then, finally getting into a relationship with somebody who is a good person, a generous long-term thinker, not a selfish short-term thinker, but both of us having brought our baggage into the relationship and that causing 10 years of fighting to me, you know, even going into an extremely deep depression. And so combined with our fighting, I am suicidal ideology, alcoholic, cocaine addict, um, because I'm re-grieving my sister's death from when I was 17. Talk about complicated, right? And so, and meditation bringing me out of that. And then, you know, with meditation, maybe you experience this or not, but you start to get answers. And so me getting information that led me to further solutions. And so 
you know, changing my brain structure and then also listening to the voice, capital T, capital V in my head, telling me, hey, um, instead of hitting your husband with a talk when he comes home because he's doing something wrong, uh, what are you not asking forgiveness for? And I went, ooh, look at this. We just evened out. I've, I'm feeling okay right now. That's so a really good cool skill. Yeah. All of these, you know, so this is what's the, I mean, I thought I was going to write one book and the universe said, no, motherfucker, you got eight. So it's, I don't know, I'm built, right? Like, like my, the last book I wrote is called Custom Made. I am custom made. Maybe the abuse of childhood that I had has made me somewhat, uh, what's the word when you're separate from people? Um, detached, okay. right? Maybe there's some detachment there. That's a question I've asked myself. Um, and, and so the, you know, the combination of my brain being built to assess things a certain way, ask myself, what is the evolutionary purpose of this? When what goes through my mind in a moment is I want revenge, fuck somebody. Um, sorry about the swear words, but you know, so there's, my brain works in a specific way that is targeted to understanding things by using myself as a guinea pig first and then putting this information out to other people. And, you know, we see cause and effect. Once is nothing, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. If I have somebody repeat my process and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else, and it works for them, I'm seeing a pattern here. And so just this, this brain with this experience and these capabilities makes me built to do this. That's a really elegant answer. I, I wish I had that. I do not. I would rather not literally you, deal with you, cancer than relationships. Um, you are custom made for where you are. I was not are. custom made for this. It's you are, you are doing, I don't know that people who aren't in the field realize it, but you're doing something really special that not everybody can do. Um, you know, I've got 30 years of experience and I kind of know what I'm doing. Can't do what you do. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of people don't understand how difficult the path you've chosen actually is. And um, so just to acknowledge that. Um, well, one last question. Um, do you think I can ever get an honorary degree? I don't um, I don't know the answer to that. In, I would like to make years. something up, but I genuinely don't. In 20 years. I'll go get it in 20 years. <laughs> I, do you need it? Uh, it's, it, it seems like you're, you're doing good stuff. That's a good point. Um, honestly, when I first got my doctorate uh, back in the mid 90s, uh, you know, so forever ago, uh, when I first got it, I'm like, oh, everybody called me Dr. T. And um, that lasted about two years. And now everybody in my life calls me Scott, you know, just students, colleagues, patients, you know, I, it, it, it only opens the door for me to do what I want to do, the, the title itself. Um, holds no particular, you know, being a professor holds no particular ego for me. Being a doctor has no particular ego balance for me. Um, it's, it only gives me an open door to go in and do what it is that I enjoy doing. And what I enjoy doing is teaching and coaching, um, you know, teaching people how to do therapy. And I enjoy the therapy itself, although I don't really have that much time for it anymore. Uh, my own personal caseload is maybe uh, five or six people at a time. And, and then that's not even always once a week um, because I've just got so much other stuff to do. I just don't have the time to do it. Um, like making TikToks. Like, and yeah, that, that, that doesn't happen on, I make you know? <laughs> really sure. Actually, I try re to, to really kind of separate. I never can leave off my science hat, but I do try to leave um, the professorial role. You know, the, I'm an authority, listen to me. Uh, you know, I'll relay a lot of uh, data and facts and processes, but um, I, tr 
at least I hope I don't come across as, you know, an unquestionable authority on stuff because I'm, I'm just a nerd talking about nerd shit. Um, and that's that. all it is for me. That's why we love you on TikTok. I don't, I don't, oh, I never intended for it to be a big deal. I, and it's not, I mean, it's not like I have a big channel or, or anything, but I never intended for to get any attention. My initial purpose was to make these videos that I could play in class and use them as kind of family guy cutaways and then come back to the lecture. I never actually anticipated anybody would actually watch them. I love that you like Family Guy. Oh, you just keep getting better. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, thank you, Scott. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. This was fun. Let's do this again, okay? Absolutely. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Yeah, me too. Goodbye. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.